Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting. Connecting new money with old money since 2018. And by Change Now, a limitless crypto exchange. Cake Wallet, Sweetwater Digital, and Change Now are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in monerotalk.crypto in your cake wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews podcast rock star Jack Resider of the Darknet Diaries. Jack has been interviewed many times about his success in the business of telling Darknet-related stories, but in this convo, Doug keeps it focused on, you guessed it, Monero. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Jack, thanks for coming on, man. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Do you watch Monero Talk? Have you ever seen an episode? Mm, no, I haven't. But man, I'm getting deep into crypto in all the different spheres. So it's it's just, there's just too much to try to absorb out there. So I'm just excited to uh, be part of anything crypto right now. Okay, well, hopefully we set you down the Monero rabbit hole a little bit today. That, <laughs> yeah. that would be a, a success. I, I would consider that a success. So you said you're you're just kind of getting into crypto now. I'm I'm, I'm a little surprised given your. Uh... Oh no, I've I've been in crypto for a while. Um, uh, you want a little history of what I've done? Sure. Yeah. So um, my friends got me into some Bitcoin mining. I think in 2013, 14. Um, we didn't have very good gear, so we barely squeaked by. But I did buy a Bitcoin. I think it was somewhere around six hundred dollars back then, right? And uh, just held on to it, not sure what what was really going on. And um, then I started a, a podcast called Darknet Diaries. And I was working at the time, but I was kind of feeling burnt out. And around the same time, Bitcoin was like at eighteen thousand dollars a coin. And so I sold my Bitcoin, quit my job, and it gave me three months of let's see if I can get this podcast off the ground. And sure enough, I was able to land my first sponsor in that in that time. So. Uh, oh, that one you Bitcoin, your, your Bitcoin to fund your the podcast. Exactly. Yeah, it got me going. It, I was able to quit my job and start my own venture. So now I'm a full time podcaster. Um, I, you know, B Bitcoin is a little bit to thank for that. But since then, I've set up, you know, some some donation wallets and I've got my Monero wallet up there. Somebody really wanted to donate Monero to me. So I looked into it and I was like, whoa, this is a lot harder than just getting a, a private key and saying, here you go, send it here. Um, and so it took me, you know, a weekend to figure out how to get a Monero wallet going, but oh, I got yeah. it going and I've got some donations coming into it. So okay. I am, I am a Monero holder. What was the difficulty with, well, first of all, it's awesome. You did that. Uh, anybody that's listening today, uh, please go check out Jack's podcast. If you don't know it already, and I'm, I'm sure actually probably most people do. I mean, the podcast is, is amazing, dude. And it sounds like you made the right move there, selling your Bitcoin to bootstrap your podcast, which you have turned into, uh, I don't know. I don't even know how to how to describe it compared to anything else. It's, it's insane. It kind of reminds me of, uh, you're like the Ira Glass of yeah. information security. It's, it's Yeah, it goes like into quality. stories of hackers and cybercrime. And yeah, I mean, we do get into some dark net market stories too. So it, it's fun to hear what happened there. But yeah, it's kind of the uh, the whole story, right? I don't want the news. I don't want to interview a, an expert. I want the person who was there, did the crime or was the victim. And then the whole story of what happened after that and how they got arrested and went to prison and got out and went arrested again and went to prison again or whatever the case is, right? That's the stories I'm looking for for the show. 
and they're so well told, man. They're so addictive. I was trying to do you mean I've heard your podcast here and there, but uh not a regular listener only because I'm always just trying to consume Monero stuff. Uh yeah. but I see it as like it's addictive once you start listening to it. It's just like so smooth. You just want to listen to the next if you listen to one minute, you want to see what happens the next minute. So you do an amazing job with the storytelling. Would love yeah, thank love you. To see you may be uh tell a Monero and Monero based story. I know you've I've heard, I think I've heard Monero mentioned in one or two where you're talking about the dark net, but uh, would love to hear a more Monero focused story. Have you looked into that at all to see if there's anything there that you might want to uh, tell a story? Um, the the times where it comes up are at dark net market stories, right? So some of these ones like Alpha Bay, for instance, accepted Monero as payments between sellers and buyers on that dark net marketplace, right? And so um, that was. That was part of the seizures when the police raided them and stuff. This, uh, you know, it was uh, it was interesting to see that that was useful. That was used there, and so I've seen it used in other darknet marketplaces as well. Um, obviously, for the extra security protections and and, and anonymous uh, options and privacy is, and et cetera, it's uh, a little bit better in that sense. Harder to track. Um, so that's why it's used there, and that's where things have come up now specifically. Uh, like a store, a cybercrime story around Monero. I mean, I'm sure there's been people who have lost their wallets or have been scammed or stolen, um, and their their stuff has been targeted in that sense. But um, from you know Monero's point of view, but uh, I haven't added anything that was kind of exciting that kind of hit my radar. Okay, um, I could think of so many. Um, All right, you know maybe uh, try to track down Nicholas Van Saberhagen, the the creator of of the Crypto Note Protocol, or actually one um, that could be good because you mentioned Alpha Bay. Uh, I don't know if are you familiar with the? I think his name is D Snake. Is the guy who started mm -hmm. it? Well, I think he was a moderator there. Um, I don't think he was the 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 admin, just a moderator. Okay, because you know, as you know, they closed down, um, and then. White House market was on the scene for a while. I don't know if you've heard of that one, but mm -hmm. that one was strictly Monero. And uh, I think it's an interesting story because they closed down. They just closed down and like retired. They didn't get caught up in anything. Uh, they literally are like a success story in terms of uh, a dark net market. So I think that's a, that might be something interesting. And then I saw this guy, D Snake, recently relaunched Alphabet. Uh, and I think it's Monero only now. Um, so be, I don't know, I, I'd be curious to go down that path to find out more about this guy um, who, you know, started Alphabet, uh, shut it down, and then supposedly reopened it as Monero only. Mm -hmm. It's pretty interesting that he's been seemingly successful. But how would, how would you, because I'm just curious, how would you even go about doing a story like that? How do you even get in touch with these guys? How does that go down? Well, to, just to clear something up, I believe the uh, original admin for Alpha Bay is dead. Um, I mean, that's the that's what the story goes. And he was a moderator, maybe secondhand man. I don't know, but um, yeah, I think yeah he's one I, of the admins or something. Yeah, well, yeah, one perhaps. So um, yeah, he was definitely part of the original one. That's for sure. I'm just not sure his role there. Um, yeah, I mean, so I I collect stories in a few ways, right? So I'll look for. I look for news articles that have certain things that I'm looking for, like biggest hack ever or <laughs> something like that. Like if that shows up in the news, uh, mm, something's interesting there. Um, and I'll I'll look at it. I'll go to you know you watch a lot of conferences on YouTube, and so if somebody gives me a good tells a good story at a conference, I'll ask them, hey, do you want to tell that on the show? Um, yeah, and uh, I'll I'll reach out to to people through. Um, whatever, I mean, people are pretty available. So, you know, LinkedIn and Facebook and, and Twitter usually gets a good amount of people there. So I can usually find someone there. Um, if not, there's a lot of people who reach out to me and say, Hey, I did this crazy stuff and I want to tell you all about it. And so I've probably had about six episodes where people just bring me stories. So it's mostly people that, you know, obviously the, the the crime is in the past, and uh, they're they're not implicating themselves in any way by coming on their show, and they're already kind of public figures type type of thing. Yeah, exactly. They've already done their done their time. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to keep it Monero focused if you don't mind, only because I've yeah. seen I was googling you. I see that you've had so many interviews. Uh, and I've seen a lot of the same questions asked. So anybody that's interested in learning more about Jack, 
uh, just Google him. People have been interviewing him left and right um, because he uh, has blown up and uh, he's uh, uh, interesting. I mean, uh, I think just podcasters are interested in interviewing you too to kind of learn mm -hmm. about how you've even managed to create such a successful podcast. But with sticking with Monero or kind of going further down that, uh, you mentioned you had difficulty when you were um, trying to, I guess, use Monero or add it to your, as a donation thing. What, what was the issues that you had? Just curious. Yeah. So, I mean, at first I was like, well, let's just create a Monero wallet on Coinbase that I can send donations to. But Coinbase doesn't have Monero, or at least at the time when I was trying to get it. And I was like, well, that's kind of odd. All right, so I'll just get Monero wallet on my ledger or treasure or whatever, you know, and say, let's just put it on here. And that wasn't a straightforward option. The, the To do that, you'd have to run your own, I don't know, his node or something like that and, and get it going and then transfer it over. It was not as easy as all the other coins. And so I was like, wow, this is a weekend project now. This is not a, uh, a one hour and done. So yeah, it, it, I had to get the, and I'm always, I'm always very cautious of clients, right? So when you're downloading a full client, um, is it, is, does it pass the checksums? Is it the, the official client and all these kind of things? And, um, is there a better client out there or what's all this, right? So you got to shop around for that. And then there's the GUI client and the CLI client and, I like CLI, but it looked a little bit more complicated. So, you know, I, yeah, I had to compare all these things and um, eventually I got it going. And then once you get it going, it takes an hour to sync um, just to make sure you're on the right, I guess, blockchain or whatever, and everything's looking up updated. And then I was able to finally uh, have a <laughs> wallet that was available. So, yeah, it was uh, it was quite a process. Okay, I, I mean, uh, yeah, it sounds like you're doing it in the in the most purest form possible, which which is good. Um, but uh, I don't know if you, there's there's a lot of mobile wallets now, or a few that are are trusted. Like Cake Wallet is a good one. I don't know if you mm -hmm. heard of that one, and Monero for Android. Uh, so it's it's to the point where it's just like you just download download wallet and you got, you're up and running, you know, as quick as the it takes for the for the application to download. Yeah, I think at the time I wasn't too keen on phone wallets and it i might have even been before cake yeah you know cake didn't that wasn't until like 27 yeah yeah because well you know one of the things i like to do when i when i build one of these wallets is to get whatever backup option there is and then destroy it all and then see if i can get back in again right so uh something that i'm more familiar with is is you know desktop and 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 apps uh, on a computer versus on a phone I think it's easier to go through that whole process on, on the phone. It's a little bit trickier sometimes, and it's kind of magical. Like you're not really sure what's going on behind the scenes, but I understand what's going on on a desktop. So that's another thing I, I usually do. Gotcha. Gotcha. That is, that is the right way to do things. Um, so you're obviously a big, uh, privacy advocate, or you're somebody that understands the implications of, of, how uh as we transition into this digital age uh, all our, our our data is at stake and in the what i've heard you say and talk about on your show a little bit and in your um the, you know the uh the episodes you've had you kind of you kind of bring that up it's a reoccurring theme so um in in your what's your take with crypto with that regard so monero is trying to be digital cash um it's it's trying to be private by default is this something that you find to to be very important with regards to crypto or I'm just curious what your take is on on, on all that yeah i mean i i like the uh, the privacy that crypto offers i think it's it's really cool in that sense especially with all the um the defi stuff going on where you can swap coins without you know know your know your customer or whatever it is and having to give your driver's license and stuff just to switch from one coin to another is uh, really frustrating and so i like being able to just work in the in the crypto space without having to use a centralized exchange and stuff like that uh, is really starting to look really good as far as privacy goes uh, in my opinion and um yeah i like to be able to work in this space without having to give you know my address and a phone billing phone number and zip code and all that just to buy something online so it's um it's yeah i like crypto to be able to do that yeah, one of the things I was thinking too, as I'm listening to your story, I mean, all your stories are basically about criminals at the end of the day, correct? Is that is that fair to say? Uh, I mean, there's some social engineers who do it 
you know, professionally and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I think maybe 50% is criminal related stories. Right. And I think that, well, for one thing, that certainly makes them exciting. Um, but I think it's, you're, you're really, um, you have your finger on the pulse of, of, you know, kind of the internet at, at its worst, right? What the, the bad things that could happen on the internet, which I think is, um, you know, important and uh, certainly entertaining. And so knowing everything that you know, because you obviously follow this stuff very closely, are you ultimately concerned about technologies like, like Monero, which offer... Uh, you know, extreme privacy, digital cash. So people might be able to get away with things that they weren't able to get away with otherwise, you know, uh, doing ransomware hacks, things like that. Or do you ultimately see the benefit of these technologies? Yeah, I ultimately, I'll ultimately see the benefit. It's kind of like fire, right? You can't invent fire and then say, oh, the bad guys can't use it. Um, it's got a lot of benefits to it and the benefits outweigh the bad. And I, I think uh, that's the kind of side I'm on there is it's got a lot more usefulness than what people can use it to do bad things with. So um, keep it around for that reason. Yeah, I mean, couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. Um, do you think society is is starting to realize that as well? Or because it, it seems like, you know, mainstream, um, at least mainstream media, right, kind of pushes the narrative that, you know, these things can be used for nefarious purposes. So, so watch out. But do you think uh, society in general is starting to, to see, see the benefits of these types of things? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, you, you get a lot of people who are really skeptical or see some bad things and think it's just associated to that. So it, it, takes, some, it takes some explaining to some people who don't understand it. But yeah, I think, uh, I don't know if it's just me, but it feels like there was a big shift in the wind in this year of things just becoming so much more mainstream when it comes to crypto. And there's a ETF, a crypto ETF. There's, uh, you know, auctions at Christie's, you know, and all this stuff is happening in the crypto space that it's just really difficult to ignore. And I mean, even people who have no interest in it at all or seeing it everywhere so um it just seems like it's becoming much more mainstream than than it was before and it's still what what's i still think we're very early at a lot of this stuff because it's still pretty difficult to manage and, and deal with like i said it took me a while just to get things set up now granted it was still a lot faster to do that than probably open a bank account but it still feels like things are when when things are difficult and clunky and clumsy just to get going um it, I, I really feel like that's still early in the space, right? And when things become a lot more user-friendly and easier to deal with, and that's when um, it's more mature and more, um, you know, mass adoption can, can happen a little better. So I'm excited that I'm here early still, and um, there's a lot more to, to come, you know? It's, it feels like a good time. Yeah, definitely a good time, man, definitely. I, I love your uh, your disguised background there or your... The way the way you're blending in that 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 yeah do you we do you reveal your identity at all I, I haven't really uh no no okay. that's the thing I'm privacy primary yeah, no, privacy I, focused so it, yeah. I have a little filter on my camera that you can see the shape of me but not my actual <laughs> details and you've managed to maintain that pretty well you think mm -hmm. yeah so far I mean w what's happened in the past was just playing around uploading some YouTube videos. Uh, somebody spotted something in the background and kind of, you know, triangulated where I was filming it and just discovered that's my house and put, you know, like looked at county records to see who owns that house and had my name and stuff like that and was able to f identify me and find me and, and email me at work. It was like insane what they did. And so ever since then, and that was just fooling around then, I hadn't really taken any online presence seriously. Um, ever since then, I've really pulled back from the internet and said, "Whoa, this is uh, <laughs> this is a, a crazy place to uh, put your real self out there." And I, I didn't even put my name out there and stuff. This was just kind of what they discovered from from you know meta details in in the frames and stuff. So, yeah, that was kind of a scary moment. And luckily, nothing happened. They were just a really big fan wanting to say hi, uh, <laughs> but it was it was really scary. And so, you know, ever since then, I'm like, "All right, I'm not putting my face online. I'm not." saying my location or about my family or anything that could be personal 
and just talk about the things that <laughs> are, uh, you know, I want to talk about publicly. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I, I really kind of covet that, right? Because I, I, I didn't take that approach. And uh, there's certainly something to be said for maintaining, maintaining your privacy. Obviously, it's, it's uh, a great thing to be able to do if you could pull it off. So were you, were you ever a hacker? Did you ever, did you ever hack? Well, I, I think I had um, like too much of a helpful mindset or a good mindset. I didn't ever associate myself to the, to the dark side, but I mean, I've, ah, it's hard to say, like I've snuck into movie theaters, I've shoplifted and I've hacked things, but never like to us and to an extent that would cause damage. It was just more, mostly just playing around, hacking friends, hacking video games, this kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I kind of saw like how this path could lead to a, a more problematic future and pulled back and got scared and stuff like that and didn't really go too deep down it. So I, I, I kind of shied away from it, but, um, you know, as a teenager, you, you don't really know where the, where the line is sometimes. And so you, you get into it. So you, well, you, I guess, so you have, you have the mind of a hacker, um, you certainly yeah. and hackers. Yeah. And so, you know, professionally I used it for good and I, I got a job as a network security engineer and I tried to secure the network and keep the hackers out. So I was able to take my knowledge of, of, of what I knew and put it, put it to good use. So when you, when you look at crypto, um, I guess Bitcoin or Monero in particular, do you see any potential exploits there in terms of, you know, cause everybody says, you know, these, these things can't be hacked. They can't really be exploited. The protocols themselves. What's your what's your take on that? Oh you... yeah, so I mean, I was just talking to someone today, and they gave me a they gave me a story that was really something I hadn't thought about before, which was uh, what they did was they were targeting someone who they knew had crypto, and they said, okay, um, I'm gonna fish them, right? So they sent an email with this uh, application, and you gotta click the app and load it, um, you know, and it was something believable, like um, we you know let's say they knew where the guy worked and so they they say okay um i'm from the hr or the it department of your company we want to give you a new laptop please uh please run this software so that i can you know get a good full spec on what your computer is and then we can get you a new laptop with upgrades right so it's something like believable and so the person runs the thing and nothing really happens and then that's it but what what this app did what this malware did was it um looked for any crypto wallet address that was in the clipboard, right? So when you're sending money to someone, you copy the address in your clipboard and then paste it somewhere. And what it would do is it would paste in the person's wallet, the, the hacker's wallet. And so the money would go to their wallet and not the, uh, the intended wallet, right? And so this hacker would just send all this malware out and then people were, you know, copying, pasting addresses and it was going to his wallet instead of actual one so that, that to me was just like clever that you're you're hijacking that person's clipboard and so it doesn't matter how you know secure the protocol is we can always do something to attack the end user the person holding the money and um th th we've got to be careful in that sense yeah that's that's i have heard of that one um that's a good that that is a good one so do you think we get to the point where people really can be their own banks, right? Because that, that's the end goal of crypto, right? That we're all transacting peer to peer, you know, we're running uh, wallets uh, on, our, on our phones or whatever, holding our own keys, uh, transacting peer to peer, uh, not going through any third parties. Do you think we get to the point where it's super easy, easy, friendly to do that and also secure wherein we, you know, we could hold our own money just as well as if you had it in a bank? Yeah, I think we can get there. I think there's going to be some pretty big hurdles to get there. Um, I think some hurdles we should probably pass up first are being able to pay your rent in crypto or your mortgage or your electricity bill and this kind of th thing. Because if you're if you're unbanked and you're just mostly in crypto, you've got to convert that to dollars and then convert. And oh, your paycheck should come in crypto, right? That too. So if we're if we're if we're in that space where we can do all those things, then yeah, I think it makes a lot more sense to go find a way to 
you have decentralized finance where you've got your 401k and this kind of stuff in, all in crypto. Um, and there's ways to even use stable coins now to get interest and, and do things. So it's um, it, it, the space is evolving so fast, like it's making my head spin. And this is this is kind of why I haven't really gotten so much into Monero is because there's so many things out there that I'm like, well, I want what's that about? What's that about? And what's that about? And so the space is just innovating so much you can't get it all in. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think going unbanked is probably something we'll 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 be able to see in the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you're completely correct. There's there's way too much happening in crypto to to keep up with it all. I stick with Monero because I think that the the value prop is it like the the true value prop of crypto is digital cash. Do you have any opinion there as to what you think the the real value prop of crypto was? Like when Satoshi invented Bitcoin, what what he was really trying to achieve? Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's how I see it too. Is um, Satoshi was probably trying to achieve a way for us to just send cash between ourselves over the internet. Uh, there was some ways to do it before. You know, you had I think e gold and uh, stuff before PayPal. Um, and these were clunky and difficult and slow and not anonymous, right? It was all tied to they were centralized. That, that was the worst component of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, when you have a centralized thing and the person who's running it knows that criminals are running it are, are there, then that person, that person is liable for racketeering. And uh, so they have been arrested. <laughs> like some of those sites have been arrested because they knew they were helping criminals. So you, you have that sense of you could lose all your money any day too. Um, so yeah, I think that was just needed to be with the, you know, invention of the internet and being online all the time, it definitely needed to have a, a good system for sending and receiving money. Um, it's just recently, I think that we've seen that you can do all this extra finance on it and collect art on it and stuff like that. That's, uh, I think still in its early days, I think we're going to see a lot more stuff. Um, some blockchains are so fast at their transactions that um, it's almost instant to, to the end user. And so what does that open up, right? You can have almost real-time interactions with the blockchain um, where it just is, things are changing so fast, you know? Um, like if you were in a video game and you, you know, picked up an item, it would just be in your inventory right away and it could all be on the blockchain. And like the speed of it is is going insane and every it's just wild out there it's we're, we're and I like i think we're still early days oh yeah 100 percent. i think the ecosystem is going to look completely different in in 10 years um do you have any theories you know about the creation of crypto and satoshi nakamoto and do you you know what, what, what's your what's your take on that are you just uh you no know? i yeah, I really haven't cared so much about who created it. I kind of like the the idea of of it being anonymous, and I just kind of fall into that. You know, even when I watch a ma magic show, I'm just like, I'm not trying to figure out what's going on. I just want to be fooled. <laughs> so, if you want to if you want to say you're you're anonymous and you just wanted to build this and step aside, then I'm not going to poke into it. I'm going to believe it. Do you think like a nation state? Could potentially be involved or behind behind oh any man i had that joke uh where i think it, so bitcoin i think is sha 256 is the uh hashing keys that they use yeah. there and and sha 256 was created by the nsa so i actually asked someone on my show once it was from the nsa hey was there, is there any connection here does the nsa have back doors in all the bitcoin keys he's like no that's not possible it was built so that doesn't have back doors yeah, well, it's all open source, but you know, it's it's like it's like the Tor network, right? I mean, like some of these things are, are started, you know, the internet itself, mm -hmm. right? Uh, started by the government, so there there might be some some truth to that rumor, uh, whether or not they had some thing that they were trying, you know, what they were ultimately trying to achieve, who knows? Yeah, I mean, so luckily for us, the the whole point of all this is the decentralization, right? So anyone can get in and see the code and see where things could have a backdoor or where things could be improved and make a recommendation to modify it or change it. And that's sure. great. And that's what's so great about it is when the, when these people who are, who are, you know, programming Monero and stuff are just doing it for fun on the weekends and it's just such a passion project, those kind of things are never going to die. As long as there's people who are just excited to build it and hack on it and make it, it's going to, it's going to keep going. So 
um, that's what that's what makes it exciting. And the whole let's keep looking for ways to improve it and secure it more and all these kind of things is just going to get better. And yeah, keep it going. Yeah, yeah, totally. Do you do you see shortcomings with Bitcoin? Obviously, on on this show, I bring that up all the time. I have Bitcoin maxis on here, and I, I debate them. Um, it, it gets it gets pretty ugly sometimes. Uh, the the main criticism being that Bitcoin is infungible because it lacks privacy. So essentially, coins can be tainted. Do you have any opinion on that? Have you have you delved down? that aspect of crypto and bitcoin in particular not that particular thing i think the i think the thing that's very difficult for us to kind of switch over to is the fluctuation of the prices right when things are wildly swinging around and i buy something for some amount or i i see that that's how much it costs at the store and i want to buy it um it, and it flaps around so much it's difficult to to like say, all right, how much do I owe you? You know, as well as I owe you a hundred dollars. Okay. And then two minutes later, actually that you owe me $120 or something, you know, it's, it's, that's where I think it's, it's just tricky. And, and it's, it's dizzying for me to know how much anything is worth, right? When you're, when you have a certain amount of Monero, it's difficult to do that mental calculation of like, well, how much, how much is this worth? Is it worth a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars? Like what's going on? You got to go look at the price and that's going to change all the time. So I, I, that, that's the tricky part for me. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where, and, and when you're dealing with things like your 401k or an IRA and you're putting it in this stuff and it has the potential of just tanking on its own because the, because the money doesn't work very well. Um, that's a bigger risk, right? So people aren't going to move their their stuff that's tied to the U.S. dollar into this because it's just wildly fluctuating. Um, and and I think that somehow, and I think stable coins offer some solutions to that, but that's still um, being explored. It looks like. Yeah, I think that the volatility. Uh, well, it's it it has pros and cons, right? I think it brings a lot of people into crypto, right? Because they want to come in, they want to make, you know turn their their one dollar into a million dollars by buying shibu Inu coin or something right so the volatility uh, attracts people through greed uh but yeah it it also hurts crypto as as a medium of being used as a medium of exchange um but i think that's something that happens in the long run you know once once the volatility dies down once everybody has moved over into crypto um, then we'll start to see prices settle down. At least, at least that's my theory. You know, as the network gets net, networks get larger, the less get less volatile. Yeah, and some some coins are are trying to do this with like you know, if you stake it, then it will you know people will hold it longer, and so the swings will be less, and you know, giving people reasons to just hold it and not have it swing around as much, and I think do help on that. I've heard you talk about, you know, your concern with, you know, with surveillance, things like that. I kind of brought this up before, but kind of re reframing the question. Do you see issues with Bitcoin as potentially uh, opening us up to more surveillance, you know, so with everybody transacting on a transparent ledger, um, you know, most people buying their crypto through KYC AML exchanges, and then uh, essentially being tracked and traced thereafter. Do you have uh, any concerns there, opinions there on that? Yeah, I think I think it's mostly good. Like, uh, there's not as much tracking um, because uh, it's most like it's mostly anonymous, right? You can you can get your coin into there, like after after the exchange when it's in your wallet, you're good to go. Nobody's gonna really track you around because you can swap it to another wallet or whatever the case is. Um, I, I think when you have, um, when you have like, there's a, there's a big thing now where, um, people are registering their, their Ethereum dot ETH domains, right? So they're getting domains that point to a specific address. Well, now you're tying, <laughs> now people are like publicly showing like, this is what my Ethereum wallet is. And now it's like, wait, hold on. We're not supposed to tell the other people what your wallet is. Right. Um, and so uh, that I think is kind of going in the other direction, um, even though I'm kind of in on it because sometimes you want to uh, show people what kind of NFTs you have. And that's kind of fun to say, this is you check out my wallet. This is what I'm holding and, and stuff. It's it's weird. Um, but yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I like when 
um, there's there's certain ways like when I said I have a donation page on my website there's certain things where you can set up like a unique um, wallet address for every single person who wants to donate and so it's not like one address to take you there and then you can keep cycling your wallet addresses if you want and have different ones there and I really like these kind of um, aspects whenever they're available I like getting in on that because that that reduces the amount of tr trackability, right? And so I think there's stuff that's built into it that's really great, especially with Monero that helps keep you know prying eyes out. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm I I really need to. I think Monero would be totally my bag if um, if I just got into it more. I'd probably be like a nut about it. Um, and so let let me switch it over to you and ask you like teach me like teach me like two lingo words of Monero. Like oftentimes I see. Um, you know, uh, three like acronyms in, in in different coin spaces. What's some acronyms in Monero that you know that um, I would I wouldn't know kind of as a newbie of Monero, but w would be something interesting. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. Well, Bitcoin is, is number go up. Have you heard that? I'm sure you've heard that term. Have you? No. That? What's that? So like everybody in Bitcoin is is concerned concerned about the price going up and that uh, essentially. The design decisions that are made in Bitcoin are for the purposes of the value to just keep going up and going up and going up. Hmm. And, and so in Monero, the concern more is about liberty go up. Um, so the design decisions that are made in Monero are more for the purposes of uh, preserving it as, as, as digital cash. So uh, it's making design decisions based on that. I think that's an interesting thing to, to look into. Um, yeah, and so when I go on Twitter, I see people are just using just codes and weird leet speak that I don't understand in the crypto space, and I'm sure there's something in Monero land that doesn't make sense to the to the, you know the normal eyes. But you're like, oh yeah, I know what they're saying. There's well, there, there's there's so much, man. There's so much. Well, the thing about Monero is most people stop and they look at it. Well, first of all, the fungibility, right? So you you say fungibility people and kind of their eyes glaze over yeah I think people are trying starting to understand it now because of nft so non-fungible tokens but they're not really grasping the importance of fungible tokens so in monero it's all about fungibility 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 and then people are like well whatever like why do you care so much about fungibility and the reason people in monero do is because they think it's essential to to cash right where every unit has to equal every other unit where things can't be tainted, you know. So if I showed up, I gave you a hundred dollar bill. You you have you don't question it, right? You're never like, well, uh, is this actually a hundred worth a hundred dollars, or is this, or did you get this hundred dollar bill from uh, I don't know a criminal, and, and now it's going to be confiscated from me because it was previously used in a crime? Uh, you don't care about that because money is fungible. Uh, mostly because it's mandated by government, right? Government, the U.S. government has said that you know a uh, hundred dollar bill is always equal to to you know it always equals a hundred dollars, right? So people don't have that concern, uh, but with crypto they do. Uh, some Bitcoin is worth more than others because of uh, the fact that it can be tainted and it comes with a history. So a mined Bitcoin, a virginly mined Bitcoin has more value than a Bitcoin that has, you know, a history attached to it that is seemingly nefarious, right? That maybe comes from a blacklisted wallet. So there, there's wallets that have been blacklisted. You could look, there's a whole list of them that have been blacklisted by the U.S. Treasury. Um, it's, you know, wallets that are associated with, you know, criminals or nation states that are doing bad things. Um and so in Monero, you don't have that. You can have that because in Monero, you can't attach any history to, to a Monero. There's no history to look up. Uh, so that's probably the biggest phrase in Monero is fungibility. So I All right. Is it Good. Something now I learned some. Yeah. So, uh, and, and really go down that rabbit hole because it's so, it's so important. It's so, so essential. It's not as fun as, as non-fungibility, as NFTs, but uh, I think it's ultimately going to be more important. And then I'd say the other thing about Monero is a lot of people then stop at that, right? So they they see it as a privacy coin, which I think is a horrible label. Uh, that's a label that's been created by mostly people in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, so labeling certain coins as privacy coins, it's kind of like 
uh, labeling cash as privacy cash, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody calls it privacy cash. It's just cash. We expect it to work in a private manner where mm -hmm. when I spend it, you can't look at my history. Um, but in, in crypto, somehow there's become this label of, of privacy coins. And really the way people in Monero look at it is, well, if it's a cryptocurrency and it actually functions as one, then it should be private by default. You got you got a good one there. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to, yeah, this is important that I get this info out to you. You have yes. uh, you have a large platform, so we'd love to see you kind of delve down, delve into this world. All right. the The other thing too, I'd say is, um, yeah, just the the decentralized nature, right? So once again, people kind of just stop at the fungibility and the privacy. Uh, but then don't even look at the other components. So the other thing that Monero really concentrates on is being censorship resistant. And it does that by making sure it has a very decentralized mining network. So in Monero, all you, the best way to mine Monero is, is with a general purpose CPU, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, in Bitcoin, the best way to mine Bitcoin is with an ASIC. Have you heard of that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've heard of both of these. Okay. All right. So so you're aware of that. So in, in Monero, it's it uses a proof of work called RandomX, and um, you know that's something that most people aren't even aware of. They just think it's you know similar to Bitcoin. It's mined with ASICs, but it, it's not. It's managed to avoid being. Um, mined by by ASICs. So it has ASIC, an ASIC resistant proof of work. And the reason why Monero is, is so concerned about that is because we don't want to see, you know, an outcome like we've seen with Bitcoin, where most of the mining is taking place by a few big guys right now. So it's major corporations now that are mining Bitcoin. It's not people, yeah. you know, mining it on their CPUs. It's being mined, you, you know, all this being mined in warehouses, whatever, uh, by big corporations. And we saw recently uh, the ability of a nation state to essentially affect the mining of Bitcoin and, and, and its hashing power by making mining illegal, right? So in China, yeah, China. and the, the hash rate plummeted. Uh, with Monero, you, would, you wouldn't ever see that because if they decided to ban uh, Monero mining, there'd be no way for them to detect, detect where Monero is essentially being mined and who's mining it. So that's another... Uh, Another, I think, big big thing that Monero does well that's kind of overlooked. Do you uh, would you ever consider maybe doing a, a Monero CCS? What's a CCS? So that's you could do a funding proposal uh -huh. to the community, and the Monero community would fund you. Because uh, I'd say where Monero is most lacking is, is is in its you know marketing department. Uh, you know, there is no marketing department. It's an open source project. So to, to, to come in and, you know, you could pitch like maybe uh, wanting to, to do a show, um, you know, or a documentary or something. And the Monero community would probably, probably mm. find it. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'll keep, I'll keep that in mind. I was looking at one of your videos where you talked about... Um, Zim Phil Zimmerman and when they, you know, in the nineties, when they made uh, cryptography essentially illegal and they were considering it a munition. Um, do you ever see that uh, potentially happening with, with crypto, uh, you know, essentially trying to, to do something like governments going to that stage where they try to maybe ban or outlaw crypto? Yeah, I think so. Um, the other thing that Phil Zimmerman got into was trying, trying to create a privacy phone, which is really fascinating because, you know, Apple and Google are the two titans in the mobile space and they're collecting tons of data on you and storing it and giving you marketing stuff based on what you're, I mean, sometimes even just with the mic on, <laughs> they turn the mic on when you're not aware of it, right? And so Phil Zimmerman's like, let's make a, a phone that's so private that this stuff's not going to get in. So um, yeah, he's been he's been doing some really interesting work in that space, but um, yeah, I think uh, I think coming off of the uh, encryption argument is that you know we were coming out of the Cold War, um, kind of uh, with Russia, and there were certain algorithms that were kept under lock and key, and we didn't want communications going over the internet that were you know stronger than the uh, military 
military grade encryption that was already like a considered a munition. So they, they just didn't understand how the internet was going to <laughs> explode to where it was. And so they were trying to not have encrypted communication. Um, I, but I do think that I, I'm not on the forefront of this, but I do think that there's powers that be that uh, don't like, um, uh, you know, crypto and want it to uh, go away essentially, right? And so, you know, regulating it, banning it, I mean, the whole um, KYC, is, you know, making sure things are regulated properly and stuff like that. Um, I, I think I think we've got to play their rules or else we're going to lose it all. So I, I hate KYC, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, I guess that makes this um, exchange trustworthy and auditable you know like they get audited by certain regulatory agencies and those kind of things are nice because now you know it's not just some fly-by-night exchange or whatever it's actually got a lot of security safeguards in place so it's kind of like one of these win-lose situ or i don't know it's it's a balance um in a lot of this space of just trying to play by the rules of the governments of the world and also try as hard as we can to keep it anonymous and private. Uh, it, it's tricky. And uh, I think some governments aren't liking this. And they're like, wait, we can't control the money. And, and I mean, because whoever controls the money controls the power as well, too. So it's, it's, it's a shift of power at the same time. And I think that's probably what they're scared of the most is how, how they're unable to control it. And, and that, that's what they want control of. It's... It's, like I said, I haven't studied that in a while, so I, I'm a bit rusty on a lot of these concepts, but that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, no, all, all good points. So w what's your opinion then on, on how things may shake out? Do you think crypto and the decentralized movement wins in, in at the end of the day? Is it something that's unstoppable or do governments figure out how to thwart things? Yeah, I think... I think it's unstoppable right now. I think it's going to be difficult. I mean, we've got we've got some crazy governments going on and some crazy uh, regimes. So, I mean, some things there's just un you can't, you can't stop uh, you know, totalitarianism sometimes. It just wins over and you have no choice. But uh when uh but, but uh, you know, it, it's got such a movement at this point. It's going to be really hard to put that genie back in the bottle, I think. I agree. I agree. I'm an optimist in that in that regard. So, uh, Jack, I, I think I think that's good, man. We covered a lot. I don't want to uh, waste too much of your time here. You want to tell people where they can find you and things like that? Mm, yeah. Well, my podcast is Darknet Diaries. You could pretty much use any search engine on the planet to find it. And I'm on Twitter the most, and my name there is Jack Resider. Awesome, man. And uh, if you do you uh, get more interested in Monero? You know, stop by the Monero subreddit or something or yeah. consider doing a Monero CCS. Uh, I have a feeling there'd be a lot of supporters out there for your work. You do am you do amazing work, obviously, as, as you know. Yeah, I definitely have to get into it more. And um, I'm excited that one of my listeners got me into it. So it's just, you know, little steps. Uh, you, you can never jump all the way into crypto. You just take little steps. And this always get, helps me get a little bit better. Yeah, Matt, send us um, send us the link to where you have your Monero address posted, and I'm sure people will will send you some tips. To watch <laughs> yeah, it's uh, darknetdiaries.com slash donate. Oh, cool. Okay. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. Greatly appreciate your time. Yeah, it's fun being here. Thanks a lot. Awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.